Some great songs. A lot of these songs are probably new uh, to a lot of you guys. Um, a few of them haven't made it onto CDs yet, but um, I, I hope you enjoy them because they are amazing songs. And uh, we're, we're not going to sing a million different songs all week because, uh, well, there's not enough time. But um, we, love to, we love to sing new songs. Uh, it's, it's great to hear Casey talk about the UN. Um, it's, it's fantastic because I, I feel like I can relate. Um, I work in Auburn, um, which feels a lot like... <laughs> which is a lot like the UN in some ways. But uh, thank you, Casey, uh, for your, your story. It's amazing what God is doing in uh, the highest reaches of government. I want to talk to you about one, 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 one faith, to be precise. Because you know what? You look at a person next to you, they're a bit different to you. Uh, unless you're one of my twin, identical twin daughters, if you look at the person next to you, um, they're different. They may even be a little bit strange. Uh, you may be the one who's being looked at, and that's okay. We're all very different, but we're all here in this one room. We're, we're from all over Sydney, and we're all here. What is it that, that brings us all together? What is it that means we're all here? What is it that means that all these guys set up all this stuff for, for the last 24 hours is faith. It is our belief and our, our faith in God that means we are here. And I thought, what is that faith? What is the one faith that we have, that we share? What is one faith? So I looked up my Bible, because I'm the scholarly type, and I found this, this excellent verse in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, you can look it up if you like, um, but you don't have to because I'm about to read it to you. And it says this, The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It is our handle on what we can't see yet. Isn't that great? It is our handle on what we can't see yet. I don't know about you, uh, but when I was growing up, uh, some of you are probably still doing that, when, in, in January, most of the time, in summer time, in my house, we would go on holiday. And in our house, we didn't have a lot of money, so it meant getting in a car and going up to visit relatives up the coast in a fantastic place called Tari. Anyone heard of Tari? Ooh, awesome. All right, so um, we would pile into the Kingswood wagon. Does anyone know what a Kingswood is? Yeah. It is the most fantastic rust bucket on the planet. And uh, I would sit in the back seat and my sister, whose name was Carol, would sit, actually her name still is Carol, she would sit on the other side and in between us would be a, a stack of suitcases. Because my parents thought that if there was a stack of suitcases, the, the, the probability of one of us punching the other was less likely with the stack. Right, so there's, there's, there's me here, my sister there, uh, my mum rides shotgun, my dad drive, and in the middle of the front, right, this is a bench seat. These are the most awesome things. I think they're illegal now, but I don't know why. My sister's alive. My littlest sister sat in the middle between mum and dad, totally out of our hair because she was a lot younger, and uh, she sat in the middle and, and look out there, and we sat in the back, and about... 38 minutes, I would suppose, into every trip up the coast. Because I don't know whether you've done the trip recently, but back in my day, it took six hours to get to Tari, near enough, by car. And that's including the fact that you could travel on the freeway in those days at 120 kilometres an hour. How cool is that? All of you who are just getting your licence are going, oh, doesn't matter anyway, I've got peak plates. But anyway... About 38 minutes into the trip, it would begin. Dad, he'd ignore me. He would, he's wise, he knew it was coming. Dad, yes, my son. No, it wasn't like that. <laughs> yes, Philip, what is it? Are we there yet? Have you asked that question? Are we there yet? Who asked that question today in the bus on the way here? Yes, there is one, there is two, yes. 
Are we there yet? Now, if I was my father, and I've had occasion to try these lines out, I'd say something like, what do you mean, are we there yet? We are on the freeway, travelling at 120 kilometres an hour. What do you mean, are we there yet? If we were there, I would stop the car, I would open the door and I would pull you out. We would be there. What do you mean, are we there yet? And to be honest, I didn't know. I mean, I knew we weren't there yet. I mean, have you thought about that? What a dumb question. I knew we were travelling up the freeway. I knew, I, I mean, I didn't know what any of the places on the freeway looked like. I didn't know what Arimba looked like. I didn't know what Newcastle looked like. But I knew what Tari looked like. And I knew we weren't there yet. But I still said, are we there yet? Have you thought about when you asked that question? You know, the truth is, what I was actually saying was, Dad, I'm out. I'm bored. The batteries are flat in my Sega Game Gear. <laughs> I have played mm, I Spy with my little eyes for at least two minutes. I've done everything I can to tease and torment my sister into playing some sort of game. I am bored. I am over it. I just want to be there. I'm saying to Dad, Dad, you know what? We need to synchronise here. We need to synchronise my battery life with your driving style. We need to make sure that I have enough to do before I get there or before we get there because we're not there yet and I want to be there. Are we there yet? What about, have you ever asked God that kind of question? Have you ever said, God, are we there yet? Have you ever been on a journey with God? Have you ever thought about your life as a journey with God? Travelling through something in your life and you know that there's an end point. Maybe it's exams or a rough time at home. Maybe it's a rough time at school. God, are we there yet? Is this over yet? It's a great verse back further in the Bible from Hebrews, back to a guy named Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says some of the same thing to God. God, are we there yet? And God's response is, is, is well, it's good, right? We, we repeat it a lot. And if you've been around church a little bit, you probably would have heard it. It says, For I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Woo! It's a great verse. But the question is, when? Are we there yet? I don't know what you face in your life, but there are plenty of times in my life when I know there's this, this destiny in mind. God has this plan for my life. He has a purpose for my life. He has a destiny that he has seated deep in my heart and in my spirit in which I know he's going to take me somewhere great. Or he's going to take me through this or through that. But it's God, are we there yet? I'm so tired of waiting. Take us time and we're going to have a look at a story. In Mark chapter 4, those of you scholarly types and have a Bible. Anyone have a Bible here? Oh, a prize for Naomi. Oh, yeah. Oh, iPad. Yeah, everyone goes, I got an iPad. Mark chapter 4, right? There's this story where Jesus is taking his disciples on a journey somewhere. And he says to the disciples, we are going to get in a boat and we're going to go across the other side of the lake. I have this place on the horizon for you. This place I am going to take you and I am going to go with you to this place across the other side of the lake. Beginning at verse 35. Lake. That day he said to them, let's go across the other side. They took him in a boat, as he was. Other boats came along. Huge storm came up. Waves poured into the boat, threatening to sink the boat. And Jesus was in the stern, i.e. down the back of the boat, head on a pillow, sleeping. They roused him. Get up, professor. 
Is it nothing to you that we're going to drown? Don't you care? Awake now. He told the wind to pipe down and he said to the sea, quiet, settle down, I'm trying to sleep. Well, no, he didn't say that bit, but could have quite easily. The wind ran out of breath. The sea became smooth as glass. Jesus reprimanded his disciples. It means he told them off. And he says, why are you such cowards? Don't you have any faith at all? And they weren't actually listening to him. They were in absolute awe. They were staggered. And they said, who is this anyway? They asked. The wind and the sea at his beck and call? They were amazed. And then skipping over to the next chapter, the first verse, it says, they arrived, they arrived, they arrived on the other side of the sea in the country of the Gerasenes. Kind of like kerosenes with a J. Sometimes preachers give you nice three points. I don't know whether you've ever listened to a sermon before um, or taken any notice of what they say, but by and large, a, a preacher will give you three points, and I'm not that clever today, I'm going to give you one. When it comes to getting to the other side, when it comes to moving through life to what God has promised for you, when it comes to fulfilling your destiny, there is one thing you have to do and one thing only. Do you want to know what that one thing is? Do you want to know what the one thing those disciples did was? They stayed in the boat. They stayed in in the boat where Jesus was. That is when they got to the other side. Notice the Bible doesn't say the other boats got to the other side. They must have turned back. We, the church of Jesus Christ in the modern day world, is the boat. We are the community of people through which God does his thing, through which God lives, in which God's spirit breathes. That's what we are as a collection of people. It's not just a bunch of people who sing, who dance, who worship and sing awesome songs. But what makes us the church is we are the body of Christ, the the organism through which the life of Jesus still lives on this planet. We are the boat. And I don't know what your particular part of the boat looks like. I don't know whether you're a member of a a youth group or a church meeting. I don't know what it is. But I want to tell you today two things. First of all, you need to be in a boat. You need to be in the boat that Jesus is in. And you need to be looking out for your mates and your friends in case they need to get into the boat as well. Do you guys have anything? Who, who, who did anything for the Red Shield appeal? Who collected? Who went knocking on strangers' doors? Anyone want to tell a strange? No, we won't tell stories about strange people or dogs. Or... But all right, so the Salvation Army, as part of its uh, wind-up, to the Red Shield Appeal, the Media and Communications Department goes into overdrive and they produce videos, they have celebrities come on and they tour around places and stuff. And um, one celebrity by the name of Sophie Monk came and toured Oasis, Street Level and Foster House, three of our incredible lifeboats in the middle of the city. And do you want to see what she said? Like the interview that happens after, it's a couple minutes. Do you want to watch? Uh, Let's watch, Sophie Monk. Hi, my name is Ben Moyes from the Salvation Army and I'm joined by the beautiful Sophie Monk. Thanks, Soph. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for joining us. We've just toured three amazing, inspirational Salvation Army centres. What did you think? It was my day off and I was thinking, oh, wow, and it was probably one of my most beautiful days off ever. I can't believe the people I met and um, their children and uh, we like had a jam session mm. and like sang and just... It's just it's so sweet seeing them. They, like one of the girls had a bad day and it turned all yeah. around and she was happy. And mm. to do that to one person is mm. worth it. If I could do that every day, I would. 
So, and but I've got to work harder so that I can reach more people. <laughs> so well, we're so grateful that you're here. Why, why, why the salvos? Um, my family, they're very private, but we've got a really close connection. Salvation Army's helped a lot of people in my family. My grandmother worked for the Salvation mm. Army too, and so that's why it's mm. special to me. Also, I donated um, on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire um, some of the money to mm. Salvation Army too. We love that. Yeah. And if, like, for anyone watching this, what would you want to tell them um, after your visits today to the Salvos? I'd say for people out in the streets, if they can see this, is go in because, wow, how welcoming and patient and, you know, uh, someone had a, a big bite and they support you no matter what and, you know, mm. I've never seen such sweet people. Mm. It's nothing to be afraid of and it's, you know, so it's actually very comfortable inside and mm. the things you guys do for them are unbelievable. Mm. So I'd encourage people to go in and if you see people on the street, encourage them to go to the Salvation Army because it's one of the only ones that doesn't send people away. Mm. Well, we're so grateful to have Sophie's support. If you'd like to support the Salvos, the Salvation Army Red Shield Appeal is taking place on the 25th and 26th of this month. For more details, visit salvationarmy.org.au or call 13 Salvos. Thanks, so. Thank you. How good is that? Who thought... All right, so normally when you do these videos, right, you have the question at the end that says, all right, so celebrity person, what would you like to say to the people out there? After visiting all these Salvo centres, what would you say to the people out there? Now, the normal response, the expected response is for the celebrity to say look red shield appeals coming oh you should dig deep man these salvos they do a great job i need you you've got to donate money and I'm, I'm going to be out there and i'm going to help out and i want you to everyone in australia needs to dig deep and donate to the red shield appeal right that's the standard response that's the response ben was expecting she gave the wrong answer she gave the wrong answer but it was the best answer i have ever heard Best wrong answer, right answer, is the best answer I've ever heard. Because she shows us that in those three places and in every place that there is a Salvation Army sign, symbol, or more importantly, person, it is a boat in which the life of Jesus lives. We are called to be in the boat to welcome those who need to be in the boat and to hold on in the times when it gets rough, when it gets tough, when life doesn't go right, when the storms hit, when there's all temptation to bail. Maybe the boat doesn't look quite right to you. Maybe the boat doesn't feel quite right. It's not painted the right colour. Maybe the boat feels like Jesus is asleep up the back and nothing's happening like it should. Maybe you think this should happen or that should happen. My encouragement is stay in the boat because that is the faith that we have. The faith is, let me find the words back in Hebrews, it is our handle on what we can't see yet. Our faith says we are going to stay in the boat because what we can't see yet, what is yet to come, is going to be ours only if we hold on. 